Hello, I'm Somi Aryan. I'm a tech philosopher and the founder of Impeak. My guest on today's podcast is Ian Rogers, the chief experience officer of Ledger. I have to tell you that Ian is possibly the nicest person I've met in all of Web3. He is so open and so easy to talk to, and he is really passionate about Ledger and Web3 as a whole. I really enjoyed this conversation, and I felt that I could talk to him for a few more hours. I learned so much, and the most important thing that he mentioned several times during the interview was, if not self-custody, then why crypto? This is such an important message for anyone entering the space. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I missed uh, the Ledger event. My colleague made it. I, I wasn't there. So why don't we start with uh, tell me a little bit about what was uh, like what was this what was special about that event? What was the the highlight of what um, you? Uh, announced during that event, I, I know uh, that you know it was I think a few day, days before that the news about Ledger Stacks came out. But was that the highlight, or or um, is there anything specific that you can think of that this year uh, you? Uh, oh, when I say this year, we are we're recording this now a few days uh, into January, so uh, in twenty twenty two, that was like the highlight of what you have been working on. Yeah, it's almost like it's it's a it's a good moment in um in the history of of crypto to remember what what ledger is and what it exists, why it exists. I think in some ways people um understand why ledger exists, but they they kind of lost track of how important the fundamentals that ledger pushes are um to the space. And unfortunately, a lot of people were reminded the hard way in, in 2022, right? Because Ledger has always been about trying to bring ease of use and utility to the world of crypto and web three um, without sacrificing self-custody or security. Um, you know, as we've seen, a lot of people have been willing to sacrifice security and self-custody to um to get things. I mean, particularly you know, when we talk about web three, we generally mean you know, connectivity to digital assets through the web. And there's almost no way to do that securely, right? Um, because if you don't have hardware and blind signing, then you don't have security, period, right? So when you are blind signing in Web3, if you are using a software wallet, you are insecure, period. There's no way to make, um, you know, insecure hardware secure. There's no software that can do that. Um, and if you're not like sure that what you see is what you sign, then you're insecure. And unfortunately, we, you know, we hear these stories all the time. Yesterday, we heard the story of the COO of Artifact lost a whole of his clone X. Yesterday, I heard the story of um, somebody who's prominent in the crypto punks community losing four punks, right? Both of those were sort of phishing scams, I believe, which in the end um, got them to sign something that they thought was something else. And then boom, you know, gone. So that's, that's the, that's the world that we live in. So Ledger has always been about hardware security. Uh, and if you don't have your your um, you know your uh, private key uh, stored in a place which di- which is difficult to extract, stored in a place where it's never extracted. In other words, it doesn't come into the operating system to do an operation. It stays in the secure element to do the operation. And you have a secure display. If you don't have those three things, then you are not secure. Um, and there are very few pieces of hardware on the planet, certainly not your phone or your computer, um, which are which are capable of those. And actually, many hardware wallets are not capable of those. Even an Android phone, which which has a, you know a strong box, is not capable of that. Um, you know, so that, that's the reality. That's why that's why Ledger exists. You know, to me, we're still at that moment. Um, I'm I'm old enough that I I remember the very early days of the web. I remember the internet pre-web. I remember the excitement of the web. I remember when the web was incredibly hard to use, and you didn't say, "Go to my website." You said. There's this thing called the web, and if you get a computer and a modem and an ISP and a web browser, and you don't mind that you get kicked off the internet when your roommate picks up the phone, then you can, you know, download this web page very slowly. You know, that's where we are in in kind of this this like new world of of digital digital assets. Um, so there's also like this unbundling and rebundling. You know, in in 2002, I had a cell phone which was terrible at the internet. Um, and I had a computer where I did the internet and I had an iPod, right? You know, now my life is, is very different. Um, but that's also where we are. The unbundling is your, you, you, you know, we all believe in a world that is full of a future that is full of digital assets. Um, yet we have hardware, which is fundamentally 
incapable of that. Just like I had a phone in 2002 that was fundamentally incapable of using the internet, even though I knew the internet was the future. Um, you know, so I needed a, a myriad of devices to kind of achieve the full picture. Well, right now you need your web two devices, your phone and your computer, and you need your ledger to be secure, period. So that's what Ledger does. Ledger also, again, it's important. Ledger says um, self-custody is a must. It's not optional, right? Um, and, you know, a year ago when I would say that, people would say it was like I was trying to convert people to veganism, right? They're like, oh, Ian, you're so idealistic. Like, come on, there's these great, uh, you know, things like Binance and FTX and like, do you really, who's going to, you know, the average person doesn't want to do self-custody. Come on. That's like saying the average person only wants to use AOL and doesn't want the real internet. Right. Like, you know, there was a time when people told me that like, oh my God, Ian, the internet's so hard to use. Like most people are just going to use AOL. Okay. You know, guess what? The internet got easier to use and people use the fucking internet. So shut up. Right. Same thing's going to happen here. Like if not self-custody, why crypto? What's the point? Right. And the great thing about NFTs, NFTs have fundamentally been, and by the way, if you don't understand what that means, if I say, if not self-custody, why crypto? And you're like, I don't understand. Please, like, let's have a conversation. You know, I, because I think if you under, if you don't understand that, then you don't understand crypto. Right. And if you don't understand why self-custody, then you don't understand crypto. I'm sorry. Um, and, and so, you know, that's the trick is how do people do self-custody securely? And, and look, there will be times when we do custody. I, I, you know, there's a couple of reasons I have, you know, for example, for my ledger credit card, I have some money in a custody account. It's a very small amount of money. I know exactly who it's with. I understand the risk. Right. Um, but, you know, for, 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 you know, my bag, my vault, I also segregate my mint wallet from my vault wallet. You know, there's, there's like, this is like, I also, by the way, have a lot of keys on my keychain in my physical life. I have, you know, a checking account, a savings account, a brokerage account, uh, and a bunch, this is life. This is the way, you know, this will become, this will become normal in, in the future. So I, I'm, I really digress with the, with the background here, but there, the, the one point I want to make is that self-custody is important and please don't find out the hard way. Um, you know, what I, what, what was really heartwarming for me was our colleague, Jean-Michel was at Art Basel and he came back and said, I met so many artists who said to me, just thank you because they didn't really know what they were doing. They had, they're not tech geniuses, they're artists. They had some friend who encouraged them to get a ledger. And then when, you know, the shit storm came at the end of 2022, they realized that their house wasn't crumbling, right? And everyone else's house was, you know, they had friends who lost a hundred percent of their, of their value and their value was a hundred percent safe simply because they had, you know, their ETH and their assets on a ledger and not with a custodian, right? So in a way, the less, you know, the more important it is not the other way around, right? Because if you don't have, you know, the ability to kind of um, evaluate Kraken versus FTX, you know, um, and you, know, you make the wrong choice there, it's fatal. Whereas if you're doing secure self-custody with good oper operational security, you know, your, your risk is, um, you know, your risk is you at that point, which, uh, you know, which, which you should be comfortable with. So Ledger is a company that um, our goal is to um, deliver security and self-custody without compromising ease of, use, ease of use or gaining ease of use over time. There's certainly a, a, a big, a big uh, you know, we have, to, we, have to, we have to accomplish a lot in the world of ease of use over the next, I would say, five to 10 years. Um, but that's what we're trying to do. So to answer your original question, Ledger Open is our twice a year event where we come out and show what we're working on. Just like Apple has WWDC in, the, in, in June, and then they have another event in September. We have Ledger Open in June. Last year, we did it at NFT NYC in New York. We don't know where we're doing it yet. This year might be back in New York, might be somewhere else. And then in December, we do it here in Paris. We're based in Paris. Um, and that's our big event. Now, our December event is also our developer conference. So like Apple's WWDC, um, you know, Ledger is a platform that you can build on as a developer. You can build apps for the Nano. You can build into our open source software, Ledger Live. You can build into our DAP platform. You can integrate Ledger support into your application in like Coinbase Wallet and MetaMask and Phantom and Temple and everyone else. Um, and so, you know, we want to gather those developers on a yearly basis. And, and that's what we do there. So 
Um, the biggest uh, on the ground part of Ledger Open is a developer conference. But then again, like Apple, we deliver a keynote. And this year at the keynote, uh, we had a, a, a really exciting announcement. The announcement was for a product called Ledger Stacks. Uh, and Ledger Stacks is our new hardware wallet. Um, we had uh, a, a great reveal because we revealed that we've been working secretly with iPod inventor, iPhone co-inventor, Nest inventor, Tony Fidel on, on Ledger Stacks um, for 18 months or more, actually. Uh, I did a podcast with Tony that will actually launch, release today on, on the Ledger podcast. Um, so for, for me, if you listen to the podcast that Tony and I did and the podcast I did with our CTO, Charles Guillaume, you'll get a really deep overview of what Stacks is, both as a, as a consumer product as well as the technical solution. Um, but but the idea is is exactly on that theme of trying to move toward ease of use. So a product which is uh, which is you know fun to have, sexy, um, and but also the most you know secure product in the world. One way to think about it is you know if if um, if the existing product that we have is the iPod Shuffle, then um, then Ledger Stacks is the iPod Nano. You know, the shuffle was 50 bucks. The Nano was like 250, had a beautiful screen. You can get it in pretty colors. Um, you know, the we, our Ledger Nano S Plus is $80 and it, at every Best Buy in America, as an example, it's, you know, Amazon, Ledger.com, et cetera. Um, 150 gets you the Nano X, which is has which has Bluetooth. So you can connect wirelessly to your iPhone. And then the, but the, the stacks, um, which will start shipping this March, uh, has the world's first curved e-ink display. So you've got this, um, you know, black and white uh, e-ink display where you can put your NFT or picture of your dog or, or, or your cat, I see behind you, um, you know, any of uh, any of the above, uh, you know, on the, on the front it makes it, you know, it's also because it's got this wraparound screen and they also stack up and magnet together, which is why they're called ledger stacks. Um, you you can you can um, label the spine like you would a, a book or a folio or a notebook and, and you know many of our customers have multiples for very good reasons maybe it's a mint wallet and a vault wallet maybe one's for ETH one's for Bitcoin maybe one's a college fund one's you know uh, for gambling you know and, you know whatever you want um, uh, but but many of our of our of our you know you told me that you have multiple ledgers on your desk in front of you you know so our customers have multiple so having them be magnetic and have the spine readable is actually like a, a really um, say it's just fun it feels cool in the hand they I don't know if you've ever played with the kids toys magnetiles like it's it's sort of like that um, but it also it's practical because if you have you know three ledgers on your desk you know you just stack them up they're they stack up kind of like a stack of credit cards and and uh and, and they work so sorry that was super long that's kind of who we are oh, why I we love exist it. and <laughs> what ledger stacks what ledger stacks was i can't wait to get my hands on it i i i loved it um you know i remember when i first got into crypto i remember a time where i had all of my stuff on binance and there was times where i would look at uh, you know, I'd wake up in the morning and I could just go into Binance and like look at my uh, portfolio and I could see all that like, oh, now I saw over a hundred thousand. Now it's like, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, I lost this one. And when I think about how dangerous that was, uh, you know, and like how easily I could have lost all of it. So I, once I discovered Ledger and, and somebody explained it to me, you know, and, and through all of these watching a lot of YouTube videos and people explaining why it was important to take these off uh, the, the exchange. Once I did uh, remove it, um, I think one of the best things that happened with that was that, of course, I, it became safer, but also it meant that I never had to think about it anymore. You know, it was like it was just out of sight and, and it would just stay there. You know, it would go up, it would go down. You know, I didn't have to keep looking at it. You know, and 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 it just didn't have to think about it, and and it's so uh it's so powerful because now I'm like okay I've got crypto in uh I don't even remember sometimes how much I've got you know and it's like okay it's just on on a device and it's out of sight you know and and that's the true meaning of saving you know when you think about like how did our grandmothers uh, you know saved money in in a little jar you know put it on their 
under the bed or whatever, you know, like that, that, that's, we are sort of going back to those days of, you know, people didn't uh, necessarily want to put those money, in, uh, those things in the bank because well, they, I, I think it, it, it really, it, it's a great conversation because it, it really does this. There is a, a new freedom here, right? When you think about it, you know, people used to, um, you know, need to carry their money around with them and that's dangerous, right? Somebody can walk up to you and, and take it from you. Um, and when you really understand the way that crypto works and then the way that Ledger protects crypto, it, it's really, it's kind of magic. You know, you start to think about these use cases where, um, you know, you, you do have, you know, you need to understand it all the way. That's why operational security is so important, right? Because you do have this Achilles heel. If somebody gets access to your seed phrase, they have access to all of your accounts and all of your funds, right? So, you know, there's 24 words that a make it so you can recover your account but also if somebody gets their hands on those then they have all of your funds all of your value period right so that operational security becomes incredibly important but if if you have that um you have if you have that sorted then you're right you don't need to worry um and you know you you can the, this magic where you can take your ledger and just like throw it in the trash or throw it in the fire take these 24 words, use them as a bookmark and move between borders and reinstantiate your value. You know, that is a magic safe. Oh, I'm being threatened. So I'm going to put my passcode into my ledger wrong three times and brick this thing, right? Um, if I had a bag with $5,000 in it, that, you know, and I was in the street, that bag would be valuable if I was dead, right? Um, my watch or my car have value if I'm dead. My ledger has no value to someone else if I'm dead, right? And, and they don't know the passphrase. So when you really think about it, you really understand the, the, the security model, it's kind of mind blowing. Like we've never, as human beings, we've never stored value in this way before. To get these kind of protections, we used to need to you know, rely on third parties. And also anyone at my age uh, or even my parents' age, for the most part, uh, that lives in, you know, in the Western world is relatively lucky because they've also lived in the time of regulated banking, right? Um, you know, so we don't remember the kind of the danger of keeping your money with a third party. Um, you know, unfortunately, our generation is now learning that firsthand. Our our generation now has, just like anyone who, you know, who grew up, you know, who, who was, if you were kind of 20 years old in 2008, you know, your, your, your version of, of uh, you know, the world you grew up in is very different than mine. Um, and if, if you're 20 years old in 2022, you know, you probably have a pretty, you know, a, a, a decent understanding of what happens when you trust someone else with your money. Well, now, like really crypto and um, and tools like Ledger are are a completely new way of storing and exchanging value. You know, it, it really is different. And that's what I mean when you know, I say that you, if you don't understand you know, kind of, you know, if 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 not self custody, why crypto? Then you don't understand crypto. Then it's because like there is actually some magic here, and if you understand that magic, now you extract. You think you go from kind of um, digital money to digital collectibles, which includes you know not only art, but tickets, and memberships, and these kinds of things, and ultimately you get to digital identity. And you you have this realization um, that you know ultimately your passport or, or or your government ID will be a digital document, and now you've got a good glimpse of the future. But also you go well. Wait a minute. If if our value all the way out to our identity is a digital is is a, a scarce digital good, a critical um, you know digital asset, um, a digital thing that I might lose, I could lose or could be stolen, then Oh my God, like the phones we have today are not the phones of tomorrow. Period. Period. And that is where you go, wow, this is real. Um, so that that's the, you know, that's that's the fun, that's the fun part for me. To me, I I really like this is 2002 all over again, where I absolutely knew the, the internet was the future of humans' lives, but you know, my my MP3 player and my cell phone did not quote unquote do the internet. Right. I had to like connect them to my computer to, to sort of make that make that happen. Um, and now, you know, I know that digital assets are a big part of the lives of future humans. Um, but I need my ledger to be secure. I cannot trust 
and FTX or a Binance. Um, and that's not because I don't trust them. It's because why should I, you know, um, and the, you know, but I, and I, and I, I need that security. Um, so I want everything that my phone does. My phone is, is, you know, is also totally magic. Uh, but when it comes to time to do that secure operation, and like I said to you earlier, I super encourage everyone to listen to my interview with Charles Guillaume on the, on the Ledger podcast, because they'll get a really, a really deep understanding of, of the, the technical side of security in Web3. That's, that's really important to have. And he does a great job of explaining it. So two questions. So, so one is your, so when you look at the industry and where we are right now, so you are absolutely sure that this crypto technology is the future like you you're as sure about it as you were about the internet back in the early 2000s would you say that correct and i would actually say that this is why i don't like the moniker web 3 because web 3 makes it seem incremental to web 2 um and it's not it's actually a separate revolution in in my um uh, in my opinion you know you know, to me, I, look, I'm, I'm, I studied computer science. Um, so I, 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 just a little bit of my background, I studied computer science and I did digital music for 20 years. And then I was at LVMH for five years as a chief digital officer. And now I've been at Ledger for two years. Um, and so, but in, so at heart, what I'm always um, trying, what I'm a student of is how is technology changing culture? So that's like, that's the lens um, that I, that I look through. And so for me, the, the internet was this revolution of information. And blockchain and crypto is a separate revolution. It's a revolution of value. Um, and, and those are two separate things. Um, and, and they're not unrelated to, to one another. Uh, you know, just like, you know, the revolution of air travel was not unrelated to the revolution of automobile travel. Actually, they, they worked together, um, you know, but they were separate. Um, and I think that I feel the, the same thing here. Um, you know, we have. And, and, and by the way, the thing to remember is I remember very clearly, again, a world where people told me the Internet's going to look more like CompuServe and AOL than, than a web browser. Wrong. I remember people saying in 1999, even 2000, um, oh, this Internet thing is over. It's for geeks. Um, everyone will never have broadband. This won't work. OK, wrong. I remember 2008. You know, I, I think the stat is that, you know, what um, Apple stock dipped 40 percent on the news of the iPhone because everyone will never have a $500 smartphone, right? Okay, that's right. They'll have a $1,200 smartphone. So, um, you know, the, but, but, and now there are six point. So, so think about all of the haters, right? I had an executive at AT&T tell me that we'll never be able to do video on the internet in 2002, right? So think about all of the naysayers, all of the haters, all on that timeline, right? Um, and where are we today? 6.5 billion smartphones on planet earth with pretty high speed internet connectivity, you know, at, at the push of a button. Um, so that, that's the world we live in. So you, I think you can, in, you know, similarly, um, you know, you have digital value as this, you know, kind of new tool, right? Um, and, and we don't live in a world where the technology that I use to get into parties at NFT NYC or Art Basel is better than the technology that I use to get into the United States. We don't live in that world for very long, right? Those, this is what happens with, you know, with innovation and new technologies. You have people that say that'll never work. And those people, you know, turn out to be um, Mr. Magoo. I don't know if anybody remembers Mr. Magoo, but it's a good reference if they do. Um, and they're wrong. And the technology finds its way. It always takes longer than the people who are excited about the technology, right? I mean, we were excited about the internet in 1997, 1998, 1999, we were overexcited. We drove a bubble of excitement, right? So that always also happens, right? But then you do get this kind of 30 years of sustained growth. Um, I highly recommend people read um, Carlotta Perez's book. I think it's called... Um, Technological Revolutions in Financial Capital, a uh, very catchy title, but it's it was written in 2002 and it describes, you know, kind of technological revolutions very well. And yes, I believe that um, blockchain is a technological revolution that is at the scale, if not bigger than the Internet revolution. 
Um, and it, it'll follow the same dynamics. You'll have a gold rush. You'll have you'll have um, you'll have scams. You'll have a bubble. The bubble bursts. Um, there's a trough of disillusionment, and then you get 30 years of sustained growth. And we're already at a point where I can't remember the numbers of NFTs that Ticketmaster is develop is is delivering on a weekly basis, but it's in the millions. All right, so Ticketmaster is quietly delivering millions of NFTs every week. Um, that's that's the norm in the future. Um, and that's also what happens. I mean, NFT is such a misnomer, all right? Like saying NFT is like saying website, you know, like what should my NFT be? Okay, what should my website be? Like, um, you know, but yes, like this will become, it will become totally normal in the future. It'll become totally normal for someone to collect a digital something from a brand or a person they love on Instagram, probably in 2023, um, you know, but certainly over the next five years, that'll become you know, quite normal human behavior. A hundred percent. This is fascinating. I feel like we need five hours <laughs> for this interview because there's every word you say has, uh, it, it brings up a whole new question in my brain. So um, what would you say to people that look at those, this idea of all of your wealth being in those 24 words and they're, they're terrified by that. Like I have, I have so many of my friends that are, so um worried about even creating a metamask they're like oh my god i'm gonna cr create this thing and then you know then it's like 12 words and, and i put you know say a thousand dollars in it right and now you're telling me that i can put all of my wealth in in these words what if i lose it you know and so it i think it, it it's the source of so much worry uh for people the idea that I don't want self custody. A lot of people are like, you know, I don't want self custody, you know, because I just don't want to have to have that responsibility. Um, whereas for us, it, it comes to us naturally, and you are like, you know, I I just feel so much more comfortable having self custody. Yeah. So, no. Yeah. I, so what I would say, what I'd say to that person is like, first of all, you know, you kind of are over the first hurdle, which is you understand it. You know, what I always say is like if. If um, thinking about what to do with the 24 words doesn't freak you out a little bit, then you probably don't get it, right? I think at some like at the beginning, people are like, ah, this is some backup thing and maybe I won't need it. And I'll write it here or I'll email it to myself or blah, you know, whatever. Right? They don't take it seriously. Like, okay, that's even worse. So if you if you if it freaks you out, well, then you understand it. So that's that's a good first step. So no, I, I think you're right, you know, and I think, you know, what this does is it, it, it starts to engage people in a thoughtful conversation about where their value is kept, right? Um, you know, it's not true that your bank account insures you for millions of dollars today, right? Um, and, you know, we are at a kind of a pivotal point, point in, in human history. I also wouldn't recommend that anyone has, you know, 100% of their net worth in a crypto bag, right? So, you know, I, I think now you're starting to get into, okay, well, what's my strategy? Right. Um, you know, and again, that strategy could be spreading that value across a number of wallets and therefore a number of seed phrases. And okay, that that that's one strategy. It could be that you have some money with a custodian or multiple custodians, and you know, you start to have a portfolio strategy. And you also then start to ask important questions like, who do I trust more, myself or Coinbase? Okay, Coinbase is a US company. Um, they, they've got kind of, do they have proof of reserves or I like their proof of reserves, you know, like, are they regulated? Are they not, you know, do I, should I use this company in the Bahamas? Should I use this company? That's like, I don't even know where they are. Um, you know, like, like you start to ask important questions, I would say like that, that's, you know, that, that's the, that's what I, the way I would look at it. And then you can, you can make that judgment. I think if you look at someone like, you know, Kraken, they're the ones who've been honest the whole way through, right. For years, Kraken has a published proof of reserves. But also they have said always get a hardware wallet, <laughs> you know, like, you know, they've, they've said you shouldn't trust your money with, a, with they're the only custodian with the gut, with the courage to say you shouldn't trust your money, um, you know, with a, with a, with, um, you know, with a, with a, a centralized proposition. Although, you know, Brian Armstrong and Coinbase have been pretty honest about this too. You know, it was more than a year ago when I heard Brian Armstrong on a podcast where he said self-custody is the future. Um, and you know, I, that reminded me a lot of when I heard um, America online say AOL.com is the future, right? When you hear the, the centralized custodian say that decentralized self-custody is the future, you're like, all right, well, this is quite real. Um, 
So I think that's the thing. Now that also is on our, that's on us to make it less scary and easier for people. So we're working on a product that we'll announce in the middle of the year, which will help you um, with the peace of mind around your seed phrase. Um, at the same time, though, you still need to understand what that is because, you know, why should you trust a service with your seed phrase, right? Like, uh, again, like you need to ask, like, what are the risks? How might my seed phrase fall into the hands of someone else? If it does, what's my exposure? You know, like you should you should always like deeply understand that and be comfortable with it. And that's that's true with 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 any asset. I mean, I would I would tell people, especially now with the prices being what they are, if if you don't have you know a greater than one percent exposure to crypto, then you're probably not you know having a a good portfolio management strategy. You know, you're you're you know you're 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 ignoring maybe the biggest you know potentially asymmetric you know, risk opportunity, uh, on, on, on the planet. Right. Um, but I'd also say the same thing for somebody who has a hundred percent of their, their net worth into crypto. I'd say, you know, you might want to diversify a lot, you know, and that means diversifying your, your, your asset risk, but also, you know, your, your, your loss or theft risk. I mean, for me, when FTX crashed, um, I had, I knew I had, um, zero. It's funny because I actually have an FTX account, and I wasn't sure how much money I had to log had had there. So I logged into my FTX account to be like to say like, do I have more money in this account than I think I do? It turns out I had like four dollars and seventy cents of value in my FTX account because I move everything out and onto my ledger as soon as I make a trade. Um, but uh, the, you know, I didn't. I, I wasn't. I wasn't sure, but I also wasn't worried because I know my kind of my 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 mo is. If I trade somewhere, I move that trade then to, to, to my ledger, um, you know, but I, I did have price risk. I knew that FTX crashing was going to continue to, you know, to send crypto down. I must, I own Solana. I knew that my Solana was, you know, going <laughs> to gonna fall. So you have, you have the two different risks, right? You have value risk and you have like, you know, the risk of, of loss, um, and, and you need to look at, 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 you know, you need to understand those. What I love about crypto personally, you know, until my friend Parker told me about Bitcoin in, in 2009, I'm a skateboarder from Indiana. Like I never really thought that much about money, right? Money was like kind of ugly, in fact, right? You know, just so it's, it's necessary so that I can buy pizza at Whole Foods. Okay. Um, but, you know, crypto has really made me think deeply about value and why do things have value? And, you know, who's in control of that value and how can I be more in control of my value and my destiny? Um, and I think that that's, you know, that's just, I think future generations will think about value differently. Um, and I think that that generational change uh, will involve digital assets and it'll involve crypto and it'll involve NFTs and it'll involve digital identity and it'll involve uh, pseudonymity and anonymity and you know, multi uh, kind of identity, you know, that these things that, that, you know, my generation and past generations just did, didn't have as a part. So I think it'll, I think it'll take 25 years, but it's inevitable. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. I still have so many questions. There's questions also from, from members, but I'll try and pick uh, one of the most important ones, which is what specific user experience challenges you're looking to solve in the next 12 months in, in, in this year? Uh, it's a great question. Thank you. Um, so, you know, people all the time say, you know, Web3 is really hard to use, um, which by the way is true, but like I would, you know, the question is like, what do you mean specifically? Um, because, you know, we're, we're trying to actually solve it. So you, you can't just, you say it, you've got, to, and some of the, you know, challenges are big. I mean, look, once upon a time, again, once upon a time, we were getting online using telephones and technologies like PPP, right? So, you know, getting to where we were, you know, had broadband and broadband over cable and broadband. I remember, you know, being in college in the early 90s and saying, like, can you imagine if you had fiber in your apartment? Like, it just seemed like a pipe dream. And now, you know, it's pretty normal. And you know, as Balaji says, you know, um, Starlink has repriced the earth, you know, which is like, it's, it's, so it's amazing. Like you do get these like big step changes when you, when, when you kind of bring new ways of, of making these technologies work, you know, so for the question for me is what can we do today? 
um, because, you know, it's, again, I believe this is a 25 year journey and, you know, I, I don't want to try to build a, a, you know, a 2042 company in 20, you know, in, in 2023, right. We got to, we got to stick to what's right in front of us. So I think there are two main problems in front of us. One of them is the one that we just talked about at length, and that is onboarding, which includes the 24 words. So we have really improved. If you look at Ledger Stacks, we've got a bigger screen, bigger screen real estate. We massively improved the onboarding experience. Um, I just bought this thing at Best Buy. How do I get to square one? You know, how can I do that really quickly? Um, I've set up stacks myself, you know, 10 times at least, both fresh, fresh install and also like I've got an existing um, you know, 24-word recovery phrase, and I want to, you know, instantiate, instantiate that on a new device. Um, it's very quick now. Um, the next hurdle there is the one we talked about, the 24 words. So having a you know seed phrase backup and recovery service would be a huge improvement in that onboarding. Right. So again, not giving away too much, but this is, you know, something that we're working hard on. And it's a very difficult problem to solve, but but we're we're you'll see something from us on that this year. Um, I think the other big uh usability challenge in web three uh is connectivity, right? I I want this mint. Um, how do I connect my, you know, I'm on my iPhone, I'm using Safari, and I need to connect to this website to claim this mint or to log in to get this utility or to do whatever it is I need to do. And how do I do that securely? Um, so we're trying to attack that with, um, well, a Ledger Live, uh, which contains Wallet Connect. Also, we have a new product called Ledger Connect, which is first in Safari iOS, soon in actually now also in Safari on desktop, soon in Chrome and Brave. Um, and it is an extension to connect directly between your ledger um, and and the website. The other thing there, like like you and I talked about um, before we started, is um, clear signing is a big problem, right? So if I'm on um, some site and I'm signing something, I'm signing an immutable contract. How do I know what it is I'm signing? I can't see the contents of that contract. It just says blind signing, and I hope that I can trust that what's happening under the hood is real. Well, with Ledger Connect, we try to simulate the transaction um, so we can show you the wallet impact. Before we run some things we call a Web3 check, which are like spam filters, basically, like what's the age of this contract? Does the contract match the website you're on? Are there kind of known issues with the, with um, with this contract? And then we show you here's the impact of the contract. Um, but we would also like it so that when you look on your nano device, that you can actually read the impact. So we've now done um, clear signing things for not only da um, dApps like Paraswap, and Lido, or Lido, and um, One Inch, etc. But now we've got um, OpenSea and Art Blocks. You know, so you can use you know Ledger Live, um, you know some uh, Ledger Connect, and OpenSea, and clear sign and know that what you see is what you sign. Or you can mint on Art Blocks and know what you see is what you sign. Um, you know that that's a uh, that's I think the the, the next piece. So the two big pieces. Uh, usability challenges are onboarding, which we're working on through just like kind of improving the ease of use, and then also trying to make people more comfortable with that with that seed phrase, and then connectivity to Web three, which we're trying to um, improve using Ledger Live, Ledger Connect, Wallet Connect. The Wallet Connect V one is kind of fundamentally broken, so now we're integrating with Wallet Connect V two. So I think you can imagine, you know, if you if you fast forward a year, actually, like, even if we talked to, if we talked end of 2023, I think our challenge, our talk about usability would be significantly different because at that point, you've got ledger stacks in market. You have um, better solutions for 24 words. You have ledger uh, connect as um, a part of every connect dialogue. And that's one thing I would love the audience to help with. We're trying to integrate ledger connect into every connect dialogue right now. So we've got We've got OpenSea, we've got Manifold, we've got many others, but we need everything. Every DAP should have Ledger Connect integrated into it. And if you use um, libraries like Wagmi or Rainbow Kit, et cetera, then it's going to come, just come with it. But we need everybody to get that upgraded. But by the end of this year, I think that, you know, Ledger Connect will be a part of pretty much every Connect dialog. Um, you know, every, you know, Ledger Connect will be available on all the platforms possible. So not just Safari iOS, but, you know, Safari desktops, you know, Chrome, Brave, et cetera. Um, and then I think we'll have clear signing plugins for all of um, for all of the main dApps. 
I think that'll make ease of use significantly better. Um, and, you know, maybe we'll just be at a new plateau and we'll be, you know, trying to solve other um, ease of use problems at that point. But I think those are the two big things we have to get past um, to get to, to better ease of use. And yeah, I would love, 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 love your audience's help getting Ledger Connect into all of the Connect dialogues. You know, we're out there talking to everybody that we can, but it's literally hand-to-hand -hand combat. Like, uh, hey, it's Ian. Um, we got this thing called Ledger Connect. You know, how do you make your Connect dialogue work? Can you please integrate, you know, Ledger Connect? So if, if any any help with that is really appreciated. Yeah, definitely. Let's do that. Uh, our audience, our, our uh, holder base, uh, they're very, very engaged. We have a, a small uh, but uh, engaged community. And then, of course, because we are building a platform that is now integrating other communities so so it's going to have this network effect um but uh, they're they're very engaged uh, and you just let us know and and we can do live sessions uh, where we can bring in your experts and they can you know uh, talk us through it tell us exactly what they want us we to would do. love to do that if you want to do a you know a session with with a, the um with our developer relations team on just how to integrate Ledger Connect, we'd be happy to do that. Um, it's developers.ledger.com and everything's there. Um, it, you know, so but uh, then we also have a Discord where people can come in and talk to us directly. Um, you know, but we'd be super happy to um, to show people and, and and not just this. Like I said, there's kind of four levels of development with Ledger. You can build a nano app, um, and that nano app could be for your DAP for clear signing, um, and we can help with that. The next level up is to build into Ledger Live, right? So, you know, if you're a coin, that's like send, receive, stake, et cetera, see the balance, et cetera. Um, then there's the next level, which is a de the DAP environment, right? So if I'm in Ledger Live, how can the DAP work automatically and I don't need to connect anything? And then the, the other uh, level is integration into, um, into your device, like Coinbase Wallet has done and, you know, basically every, every wallet has Ledger support um, at this point. Um, you know, so we, we're, we're, we're really you know, driving, uh, that. And if anybody would like help with that, we're here to help. Amazing. Perfect. Thank you so much, Ian. I really Thank you. appreciate it. And I look forward to having you back. Any, any time. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate the, the opportunity. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Ian Rogers. If you're not keeping your digital assets in a cold wallet like Ledger, please do so as soon as you can and keep them safe. If you enjoyed this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it on Apple, Spotify, or any other one of your favorite podcast channels. And don't forget to give it a five-star rating and write a review. The full interviews are also available on my YouTube channel, The Somi Ariane Show.